What are the guidelines for the management of patients with mitral regurgitation? This is the topic of this lecture. In addition, however, I also want to go a little bit beyond to take a look at how modern technology that we have at hand with ultrasound can help us here. Now, usually when you read the guidelines, you kind of skip the preamble, but I think this is a very important thing to look at as well. Now, here is what is in the preamble, not only in the guidelines on mitral regurgitation, but in all guidelines. The guidelines are here to summarize and to evaluate available evidence. The important word here is available. Be aware that, of course, the guidelines have to look at the publications which are present, which are always a little bit delayed with respect to what the forefront of medicine really is, but they have to, of course, focus on what is really, really known and what is firmly established in the medical evidence. The other very important point is that it should assist healthcare professionals in selecting the best management strategy. So it's the word assist which is so important. It is not something you have to do in every case, but it's just a guideline. In other words, a guidance to your treatment of patients, and there are certain other things that you will always need to consider in specific situations. Very important. It facilitates decision-making of healthcare professionals in daily practice, so yes, that's a very important fact as well. Now, what guidelines do not do is they should not override in any way whatsoever the individual responsibility. So at the end of the day, you're responsible for the treatment of your patients. And there will be situations where you probably need to stretch the guidelines to some point because the specific situation that you're dealing with is simply not covered in the guidelines. So, be aware that the guidelines are always very conservative. What guidelines do not provide is, they do not cover all the different combinations of conditions that you will encounter, especially also in mitral regurgitation. There might be many different variants of mitral regurgitation, which specifically have never really been looked at in detail in large studies. They do not include your individual experience, which I believe is also very important, and they do not, of course, consider economic factors, the price, for example, of a mitroclip procedure and the availability in your individual country. So, in essence, uh, they do not always cover the newest advances. Should we still use them or not? Well, I believe yes, and I will show you how you can use them in the setting of mitral regurgitation. Here's a very famous quote from Hippocrates who says, declare the past, diagnose the present, and foretell the future. And exactly that is what you're supposed to do. In some situations, you will have new technologies at hand, and you will have to look at them and somehow extrapolate them, but still use them even though they might not be in the guidelines. Let's take a look at some specific questions that we're confronted with when it comes to mitral regurgitation. How do we actually assess mitral regurgitation? When do we intervene? How do we intervene? And finally, how do we follow up patients? I'll go through all of these individual points step by step. Let's start with how to assess mitral regurgitation. Well, I guess it's quite clear that the primary diagnostic tool and the best tool to follow up patients is definitely transthoracic echocardiography. That does not need to be actually stated in the guidelines, it's quite clear. But we also have transesophageal echocardiography and we have stress testing. What is the role of stress testing? Well, in the latest guidelines, the importance was downgraded. Why? Because there's just not enough evidence to clearly show how we should use stress testing, how it should be performed, and what information we can really extract from the stress test to help us in the management of patients. It does not mean you cannot use it, but it just means that the evidence is just not there to put it in the guidelines. We also have global longitudinal strain, 
this tool is not definitely in the guidelines in the sense that we should use it, but it is mentioned and it is said that actually global longitudinal strain could be a parameter that would help us, but that at present there is just not enough evidence to show us how to use it. And finally, we have a parameter that is not an echo parameter. Neurohormone of BNP is a very important one to follow up patients because we know it predicts symptoms and it is an important prognostic factor. So yes, I believe BNP should also be used in many of the patients we have with chronic mitral regurgitation. What is the role of pulmonary pressure? This too is a very good parameter. Why? Because it correlates with symptoms and it also points to maybe the necessity of performing some form of intervention. Be aware though, and this is also stated in the guidelines, that echo sometimes can be a little bit unreliable when it comes to measuring right heart pressures and that to confirm it, it would always be good to use right heart catheter. Now, let's come to transthoracic echo and let's look at some of the points that echo can actually help us with. First of all, quantification. We can look at the mechanism. We can look at the etiology of mitral regurgitation. Furthermore, it provides us very important prognostic information, and it can also display the severity of the problem, the urgency of the problem. A very important thing, again, when it comes to timing. We'll talk more about that later. Transesophageal echocardiography is important. It should be used, especially if you have poor image quality, but we in our laboratory use it also for other indications. If we have an unclear mechanism, we cannot clarify the reason why the patient has mitral regurgitation. We use it in conjunction with 3D TE, in other words, where we want to display the pathology or the morphology better than we use 3D echocardiography. Be aware that the guidelines also state that 3D echo is an important adjunct that can and should be used in specific indications. We use transesophageal echocardiography to determine whether or not an edge-to-edge -edge repair is possible or feasible. And finally, we use it, obviously, to monitor patients during such a procedure. To jump right into the topic of transesophageal echocardiography, here is just a representative image of a TE study that we performed, and here is a 3D representation of a pathology where we have a coaptation defect, in other words, a functional form of mitral regurgitation, just to demonstrate how nicely we can actually differentiate the different forms of mitral regurgitation, primary versus secondary. What you see here is you see that there is a coaptation defect between the anterior and the posterior leaflet, and we see that the regurgitant jet comes exactly from the middle region here. This is, for example, very important when it comes to deciding whether or not a patient is a good candidate for an edge-to-edge -edge repair. This actually would be a good candidate. Also take a look at the very round circumference here of the mitral valve, which is very typical of functional mitral regurgitation. Another example, now we are monitoring a procedure, and you see how nicely we can actually look at the position of the clip relative to the leaflets. In this case, we probably need to rotate a little bit to be perfectly aligned to the cooptation defect. Now, you see, there's a number of ways we can use modern technologies to enhance our decision-making in patients with mitral regurgitation. If you come back to the guidelines, you will see that there's a large table of different things that we should actually assess with ECHO, ranging from qualitative parameters to semi-quantitative and quantitative parameters. Now, of course, these are all very important and there is no time to go into all of these individual parameters, but what is very important is that despite these guidelines, we still have a number of different problems when it comes to quantifying and assessing patients with mitral regurgitation. So I wanna highlight some of these problems to display that there is a need for new technologies that could overcome these problems. Here is an example or actually three examples of patients with mitral regurgitation. Take a look at them, and I guess you will all agree that all of these three patients have severe mitral regurgitation. But are they all the same? Well, yes, we've got different mechanisms here, but only looking at the magnitude of mitral regurgitation, I always ask myself, is it really enough if we quantify regurgitation as mild, moderate, severe? In this case, we have severe, 
and very severe and maybe severe, severe forms. So probably these patients need different forms of treatment. Probably it also affects the left ventricle different. You can probably expect the even more hyperdynamic left ventricle function in a patient who has severe, severe mitral regurgitation. So are the cutoff values that I'll show you later really the right values or not? Another problem, the issue of dynamic mitral regurgitation. A patient where we have significant mitral regurgitation, he had high blood pressure. As soon as we lowered it, we got only mild mitral regurgitation. So you see, these effects are something that occur quite quickly in individual patients, and it makes it sometimes very difficult not only to quantify MR, but also to manage these patients. In this specific case, obviously, blood pressure treatment would be the upfront uh, therapy that you would recommend. Let me show you another problem we're sometimes confronted with. This specific patient received a T study to evaluate mitral regurgitation. Here is the transthoracic study. If you can try to estimate left ventricle function, I guess it's quite clear that function is quite normal. But then we sedated him. We performed a TE study and take a look at his left ventricle function right now. So pharmaceutical interventions or anesthesia can greatly affect not only left ventricle function, but also the magnitude of mitral regurgitation. A difficult problem, very difficult to more or less predict how mitral regurgitation will be once the patient, for example, is off anesthesia. Now let me turn to the mechanism of mitral regurgitation and talk a little bit about why it is important. Well, it's important because it dictates the likelihood of mitral valve repair. We determine the method of intervention based on the mechanism. And finally, if you go to the guidelines, you will see that there are different recommendations whether or not a patient has, for example, functional or structural mitral regurgitation. Let me go back to 3D echocardiography again to display what echocardiography has to offer. If you look at the normal transesophageal study, you will see that there is a prolapse. I guess the diagnosis is quite clear. But can you really appreciate which parts of the valve are affected, what the magnitude of prolapse really is? which parts of the valve actually need to be repaired or not? Well, if you use the 3D image, it's quite clear. Here we have an en face view from the left atrium to the mitral valve. This is the anterior leaflet. Here we have the posterior leaflet. And here we have the posterior medial commissure, and this would be the anterior lateral commissure. And if you look closely, you will see that there is little billowing elements here of the posterior leaflet. And you can appreciate that the entire mitral valve is actually involved, and that the most prominent part of prolapse is located here in the P3 region. You cannot get this with 2D, and this is certainly an important inf piece of information that you can communicate to your surgeon. Now an example of a patient with functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. Here on the 2D image, you nicely see that the patient has severe mitral regurgitation and that the jet originates here from the middle of the valve. And if you look at this dual view here on the right-hand side where you can see the mitral valve once from the atrial side and once from the ventricular side, you will also appreciate the specific morphology of the annulus, which is more round, and the cooptation defect and the origin of the jet. But I believe there's even more than 3D echo can actually offer us. Here is an example of a so-called easy valve analysis. What we're doing here is we're tracking the motion of the annulus and the motion of the leaflets. In this specific case, the patient has a so-called cesis mitral annual calcification or toothpaste lesion. In reality, these forms of calculations, no matter if you have this pathology there or not, is able to measure certain parameters, such as the length of the leaflets, the motion of the annulus. And I believe that these parameters in the future might even help us to predict which patients have a higher likelihood of mitral valve repair and maybe even guide the surgeon to the correct intervention. One thing which I also want to mention is that frequently we'll have a discrepancy between the degree of morphologic abnormalities and the degree of mitral regurgitation. Here is such an example. In the 2D image, you don't have the impression that anything is wrong with the mitral valve. If you look closely, however, you will see that there's a very small 
flail portion of the leaflet here. However, if you look at the regurgitant jet, you will see that MR is actually very severe. An important point to consider. You need experience as well. Coming back to the specific questions in mitral regurgitation, we already talked about how to assess mitral regurgitation. Now I would like to focus on when to intervene. Let's start with primary mitral regurgitation and see what the guidelines say. Here are some important rules that we can draw from the guidelines. Rule number one, mitral valve repair should be the preferred form of mitral valve surgery. Why? Because we end up with a better left ventricle function. We're preserving the subvalvular apparatus to a greater degree. We also have less complications of prosthetic valves. For example, prosthetic valve obstruction or bleeding to do anticoagulation therapy or thrombosis of a prosthetic valve. Here is a beautiful example of a patient who received mitral valve repair, a dual view, where we can clearly denote that there is a paravalvular leakage right here. Now, if this is the case, then the results are not optimal. And such patients, of course, do not have the same prognosis as a patient where everything went right with the operation. Again, this emphasizes how important it is that you not only have a good surgeon that performs optimal mitral valve repair, but that we also help in the selection of patients who will have a favorable outcome after mitral valve repair. Well, which patients are no good candidates? Primarily patients who have involvement of the anterior leaflet, they're more difficult to repair. Problems in the commissural regions, extensive disease, and the best pathology, the pathology that all surgeons wish to repair, is the medial scallop of the posterior leaflet. But then there are other factors, factors that we can measure with echocardiography and that have been published. The coaptation distance seems to play a role, the tenting area, complex jets, a posterolateral angle which is more than 45 degrees, large diameters, and specific shapes of the ventricle might also be a problem when it comes to repair. But this is just to show you that this whole field is evolving and we will definitely need echocardiography to assist us here. Rule number two, it's an easy one. If the patient has symptoms and his ejection fraction is above 30%, you should operate him. Why do we have this cutoff value of 30%? Well, because we know if the ejection fraction drops below 30%, the prognosis of the patient is not really good. He does not have a survival benefit. His mortality is high, and usually, especially in functional mitral regurgitation, you have a high recurrence of mitral regurgitation. In this situation, the ventricle can simply not cope with the increased afterload that you get if you repair or if you operate on the mitral valve. Let's come to rule number three. Perform surgery if a patient is asymptomatic and his ejection fraction is below 60, or his end systolic diameter is more than 45 millimeters. Now here, we're entering this very exciting arena of what do you do in patients who are asymptomatic? Should we operate them as well? Well, as rule number three says, only if we see some form of change in the ventricle that predicts that left ventricle function is about to deteriorate. Rule number four, if a patient is asymptomatic, and the criteria I just mentioned are not met, there are some, I would say, soft criteria which also point to the direction of some form of intervention. First of all, you have to have a high likelihood of successful repair. If patients have atrial fibrillation, then they also might be candidates because it shows that the atria are now being stretched and the likelihood that they would remain in atrial fibrillation if they're not operated is increasing. You should look at pulmonary pressure, which I already mentioned is an important correlate of symptoms and of left ventricle dysfunction. So if that is above 50 millimeters of mercury, you should consider surgery, but be aware that echocardiography in many situations might be wrong. So sometimes it might be good to reconfirm that with the help of right heart catheter. Finally, if you have a large left atrial volume, then this might also be a point that uh, puts you in the direction of cardiovascular surgery. In all of these situations, it's always recommended to have a good surgeon 
and to bring patients to a heart valve center where the experience is high so that you don't end up with a patient who was asymptomatic at the beginning that is now symptomatic because repair was simply not successful or not. But what do we do with patients who have very poor left ventricular function? For example, an ejection fraction below 30%. Well, here is rule number five. You should not perform surgery unless they're refractory to medical therapy and if they have a high likelihood of repair, then you can consider mitral valve intervention. Rule number six, I already mentioned this. Look at the neurohormones. BNP is a very good predictor of outcome and it predicts the occurrence of symptoms. We know that a low BNP has a high negative predictive value. This is how we can put all this together in a decision tree. If you have a patient who has severe chronic primary mitral regurgitation, the most important thing to look at is the patient symptomatic or not. If he is symptomatic, we have to have an ejection fraction which is above 30%. If this is the case, then yes, it's quite clear. The patient needs cardiovascular surgery, preferably with repair. If ejection fraction is below 30%, you want to know if he is refractory to medical therapy, you want to know if repair is possible and if the comorbidity is low, in other words, the operative risk is low, and if this is the case, you would also bring the patient to surgery. If the patient has a high operative risk and repair is probably not possible, then you would have to look for alternatives, preferably the edge-to-edge -edge repair. What you do in patients who are not refractory to medical therapy, well, if they're not refractory, you can give them medical therapy and then you would treat them conservatively. Of course, you have to be aware that they might cross over to this branch if they do get refractory to medical therapy. Now, let's turn to the other part of the decision tree, to those patients who do not have symptoms, where it's a little bit more difficult to decide what to do. Here, we have to look at secondary findings of heart failure. In this case, an ejection fraction, which is below 60%, or an end systolic diameter above 45%. If the ventricle is very large, an ejection fraction is start to deteriorate. Yes, despite the fact that the patients are asymptomatic, you should operate them. If these criteria are not met, then you can look at other criteria. For example, at pulmonary artery pressure. If it's above 50 millimeters of mercury, or if the patient has atrial fibrillation, then too, you would have to consider other forms of treatment, especially if they have a high likelihood of a durable repair and the operative risk is relatively low, you would bring them to surgery as well. If not, you would simply follow up the patients. So this is the general scheme of the guidelines and how you would approach patients who are symptomatic and those who are asymptomatic. Now let's turn to secondary or functional mitral regurgitation. Rule number one, if bypass surgery is performed, is indicated, and ejection fraction is above 30%, well, you'd also perform some form of repair of the mitral valve. Rule number two, if there is an option for bypass surgery and the ejection fraction is below 30, but there is some evidence that the left ventricle function will improve after surgery based on the fact that there is viability, then you should also consider mitral valve repair favorably again to mitral valve replacement. One thing which is important, be aware that when we quantify mitral regurgitation in functional MR, we have lower thresholds for the severity of mitral regurgitation. Let me highlight this again here in this table. You see that for primary mitral regurgitation, we have an effective orifice area of more than 40 square millimeters as the cutoff value for severe, while in secondary, the cutoff value is 20 square millimeters. And the same also holds true for the regurgitant volume. In primary mitral regurgitation, 60 is the cutoff value, and for secondary, 30 milliliters is the cutoff volume. Rule number four, surgery cannot generally be recommended in patients with functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. And there's a reason for this. The prognosis of this patient cannot be improved. There's no evidence that we truly help the patients. But we have an option in these patients as well, especially if left ventricle function is very poor and they have a high surgical risk. 
In this situation, we can use the edge-to-edge -edge repair. The procedure most of you are most familiar with is the mitroclip procedure, a procedure where we clip the anterior to the posterior leaflet and thereby cause co-optation of the leaflets and reduce mitral regurgitation. You have to be aware, though, that it's inferior to surgery to reduce mitral regurgitation. We often have some residual MR present. That, however, it does improve symptoms, but there is not yet any evidence that we really, really increase the survival of the patients. But we do help the patient in the sense of a better quality of life and higher functional capacity, and we know that the left ventricle shows remodeling if we are successful in clipping these patients. We have one more thing that we have to discuss, and that is how do we actually follow up patients? Specifically, patients who are asymptomatic have a ventricle with an ejection fraction above 60% and who have primary mitral regurgitation. The guidelines tell us that we should observe these patients every six months, ideally in a center which is specialized in valvular heart disease. On a personal note, during the intervals between the different exams, I also tell the patients that they should observe themselves more closely, and I make them aware of the typical symptoms of mitral regurgitation, which are dyspnea, a drop in exercise capacity, and also arrhythmias. So, for example, I tell a patient that if he always walks a certain distance, for example, from work to home, he should observe how easy he can actually manage this distance. And if he notices that this is more strenuous, it might indicate that his exercise capacity is dropping. But remember that the intervals at which you see the patient should be fairly flexible. For example, if you don't have a previous exam and you don't know how rapidly someone might be deteriorating, it's good to use shorter intervals. And the same holds true if a patient does show some dynamic change. For example, if you have exam A, he has a certain size of the ventricle, and at exam B, it is starting to increase. So there I would probably use a shorter interval to see if this increase in the size of the ventricle is progressive. And finally, if a patient only has moderate mitral regurgitation, it might be enough if you see the patient only every two years. What are some of the knowledge gaps we have at present? And this is also stated in the guidelines. Well, for one, we're not really sure if there might not be better early markers to help us determine if a patient should be brought to surgery or not. In the beginning of the lecture, I already mentioned issues such as strain, but maybe even better ways of quantifying mitral regurgitation, where we can truly, in a more exact way, quantify regurgitant volumes. Maybe there is a cutoff value which is better suited to determine whether or not a patient benefits from surgery or not. So a lot must be done on the technological front and, of course, in studies to prove that we have better early markers. The question whether or not elective surgery should be performed in asymptomatic patients, this is a huge field. Of course, cardiovascular surgery is improving, and the outcomes are improving. So why not operate patients before we even get to a range where patients are at risk of developing left ventricle dysfunction? Here, again, a lot of studies must be performed, and we need better imaging techniques which help us to find such markers which will indicate that asymptomatic patients would benefit from surgery. We have to define or we have to look at the thresholds to perform mitral valve surgery in secondary MR. And my personal feeling is that there's probably a subgroup of patients with severe MR and left ventricle dysfunction who would truly benefit from surgery. But which are these patients? How can we better define these patients? Again, technology and studies I believe in the future will help us. Maybe one of these technologies is advanced imaging and maybe also stress echocardiography. We also don't have a lot of information on the impact of interventions, edge-to-edge -edge repair, for example, or surgery on the prognosis in patients with secondary MR. So we will need some time to figure that out as well. And finally, we are working on completely new technologies that will help us to perform mitral valve repair interventionally. So a lot of these techniques are now being studied. Of course, they're not approved yet, but that does not mean that we should definitely develop these techniques because ultimately these might be solutions that will solve many of the problems we have at present.
let me summarize what we said about the guidelines in a very emotional and challenging case. It's that of an only 21-year-old woman who we saw first when she was pregnant in her 23rd week. She had a genetic cardiomyopathy and an ejection fraction of only 32%, and it was known that she had mitral regurgitation. She got pregnant anyway. Well, we had to, of course, deliver the baby prematurely because the patient was deteriorating during pregnancy. She was doing really bad. Fortunately, the baby is doing fine and everything was okay, but the problem did not stop then. Why? Because the patient still had very bad symptoms of heart failure and deteriorated further. Let me take a look at the images. Here is the peristernal window with the short axis view. You see that left ventricle function is very poor here. Even more important, look at the motion of the mitral valve. It hardly opens and it also hardly closes. You see that there is a coaptation defect present right here. You can appreciate that as well in the four-chamber view and the apical long axis view. We've got annual dilatation and we've got some form of restriction of the leaflet. Note that the posterior leaflet is also not moving. Now, this is clearly a functional form of mitral regurgitation, a secondary form of mitral regurgitation. And here's a beautiful example of the mitral valve. We're looking from the left ventricle to the mitral valve, and you can nicely see the coaptation defect here. Now, of course, this is only possible if we have very high volumes per second, which is the case here. We have 17 volumes per second. So these are images that definitely help us also. Remember, we now know that if we actually can see the coaptation defect, then mitral regurgitation is definitely severe. This is actually one of the morphologic criteria, which is in the guidelines. Now, not surprisingly, the patient has very severe mitral regurgitation. Remember, if you go to the guidelines, you will note that one of the morphologic criteria is if you see a coaptation defect, then MR is severe. And this is just here to confirm that MR is very, very massive. We have a broad jet, huge jet, which fills almost the entire atrium, not surprisingly. The question, however, is, how severe is mitral regurgitation really? Can we actually perform some form of calculation that allows us to tell us? We have the PISA method. And many of you are aware that there is a 2D PISA method and also a 3D PISA method. So what do we need to perform the PISA calculations? We need to look at the flow across the mitral valve. And this can actually be done automatically. Here you see the measurement that has been performed. And automatically, we get the velocity time integral of mitral regurgitation. On a side note, also take a look at the shape of the MR signal. It's triangular and the velocity is not very high. Why not? Well, because her blood pressure is very low. She's almost in shock. After we perform this measurement, we need to also look at the color Doppler signal and measure the PISA hemisphere. Here we picked an appropriate frame where we can nicely see the PISA and we already calculated the regurgitant orifice area, which is 77 square millimeters. To confirm this, we also performed a 3D measurement. This is the same patient, of course. Now we're performing the 3D measurement. We're uh, selecting an appropriate loop. Then we freeze the image to find the optimal frame. We now point the arrow down towards the direction of flow, we've got an automatic calculation of the PISA hemisphere. You see very nicely now that we get a PISA calculation already. But what is really important or what is something that you should consider is that there are sometimes variations in the MR from beat to beat. And with the 3D system, you can analyze several beats at the same time. Now we performed a second calculation. You see that there is a different regurgitant orifice area in the first opposed to the second, not a big difference, but at least we see that there are variations in not only the regurgitant orifice area, but also in the peak regurgitant volume. Let's put all of these findings together. We have a regurgitant orifice area of 77 millimeters square, both with the 2D PISA and the 3D PISA method. The reference value in the guidelines is 20. In other words, if you have a regurgitant orifice area above 20, it's severe. So this is three times 
the upper normal of severe. If you look at the regurgitant volume, we have 63 milliliters, which is also twice as much actually as the guideline state for severe regurgitation. One thing to understand in this specific situation is that because the patient has such a low pressure, there is relatively little resistance and therefore we have not so much flow going backwards. Still, despite the fact that she's almost in shock, we have a very high regurgitant volume. The next thing we have to look at is left ventricle function. You now know how important it is what ejection fraction is if you want to decide what to do with the patient. If you perform a visual assessment of the left ventricle, you will probably appreciate that ejection fraction doesn't seem to be so bad. This is not surprising because the patient has very severe mitral regurgitation and a reduction in afterload. But we do need parameters. We need to calculate ejection fraction. And the best methodology at hand is definitely 3D echocardiography. Why? Because it does not rely on any geometric assumptions or hemodynamic assumptions. And if we perform this calculation, you will see that ejection fraction is not so bad. It's 45%. But I would not stop here when it comes to assessing left ventricle function. We have another very important modality at hand, and that is speckle tracking. Here we performed an analysis of the longitudinal function in the four-chamber view, looking at how good the ventricle contracts in a longitudinal direction. And this is such an important parameter because it has predictive importance. There are studies that definitely show that if you have a reduction in longitudinal strain, patients have a poor prognosis in mitral regurgitation. Well, it's not surprising that this patient has a reduction in longitudinal strain. We see a value of minus 14.1%. But this is not such a severe form of reduction that you would say the ventricle is completely dysfunctional. What can we now say and how can we actually manage the patient? Well, we have to go back to the guidelines. Remember, if you have secondary mitral regurgitation, surgery is not generally recommended, especially if the ejection fraction is below 30%. But as we now saw, both with the visual assessment with a 3D echocardiogram and also with strain, ejection fraction is not so bad. It's 45%. Still, we must consider that this patient has very, very severe mitral regurgitation and that maybe we'd have to even use a different cutoff value in this patient. But what are the options we have? The first option we have is mitral valve repair. The second option we have is the edge-to-edge -edge repair. We can forward the patient to transplantation, or we also have the option of giving the patient an assist device, maybe for a bridge to transplantation. We have to, of course, make this decision in a heart team. This is very important because we have to get all different sides and aspects, the surgical aspects and the clinical aspects of the cardiologists and interventionalists. But in this specific situation, I think all of these parameters point to the fact that there might still be an option that this patient could benefit from mitral valve operation. I do not think that the mitral clip or edge-to-edge -edge procedure is the best procedure because the patient's function is still too good. However, it probably would be wise that if you perform such a mitral valve repair, you would do it with a so-called LVAT standby or maybe implant an LVAT in the initial phases after operation so that the patient has time to stabilize. Still, I think such decisions are very, very difficult to make at times, but with all the methodologies we have at hand, I think we can get closer to the truth. What came out of this patient? Well, we actually did operate the patient, and surprisingly, the patient did quite well. Let me now come to my conclusion. The guidelines are important. You have to know them because they are the foundation of what we do. Still, do not forget the very famous quote from William Osler who said, medicine is a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. Probability is the guidelines. It's what we know based on our scientific evidence. And the uncertainty is what we have to live with, where we sometimes have to extrapolate and use modern analyzing technologies and techniques to aid us to extrapolate those guidelines essentially to help our patients.